thank you for inviting me to come uh, speak in the seminar. Um, this is about as far away as you could get. I think the class before this was uh, CS, like one, introduction to CS. So this is an old guy looking back kind of at the 35 years I've been working kind of on the front lines of the industry. Policy side, engineering side, economic side, finance side, and development side. And you know, we really have devoted most of our careers to basically deploying capital to where we think it makes a difference. And initially, when I wrote my first draft of my dissertation, John sent it to one of his advisors who was talking about market mechanisms to, do, to direct capital and said, you know, what do you think of this? I don't know if you remember this, John. And um, he didn't think much of it because he was basically busy developing locational marginal pricing at the bulk power system. We know what's happened to locational marginal pricing at the bulk power system is it's largely now become irrelevant in, re in directing any kind of capital. No. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, we're still working on it because we think it's still important too as part of the transition. But more and more and more it is, you know, how do we get capital to where it should be? Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what I think is needed and some of the main things that we're working on to try to help facilitate the direction of capital. Um, just a little bit about who we are and what we do. John mentioned most of it, so we can quickly speed through that. I'm going to also hopefully quickly speed through, you know, we still need a grid. So we're not building, you know, distributed systems for the, for the Unabomber. You know, we are building an integrated grid. It will have lots of things in it, and it will have two-way flows and lots of communications. And it will be different than the grid we have now, but we're going to need a grid. Um, so hopefully nobody is, the grid is going away. So once we establish there's going to be a grid, what does it look like? What is the industry around it? And what are the driving forces behind that grid that are going to shape it? And then once we know what the grid needs to look at, like we can then talk about what, are, what do people think the people and the stuff and the institutions that can get us as quickly as possible to a grid that looks like that. Um, the thing we've tried to do, and um, when I'm down on campus, which is once a year or so, I always go see somebody that I've known for a long time. I was sitting down with Jim Sweeney, and Jim said to me, you know, um, I know Jim gets to go out once in a while and then come back. And I said, you know, as somebody who's on, you know, the front lines all the time, we don't get to throw as many rocks all the time, but we do try to stay right squarely in the middle, the middle of developers, state agencies, legislators, consumer advocates, along with environmental advocates and utilities over there. And if you look at our projects every year, we do about 75 projects a year. And they're equally split among these. That's on purpose. We try to stay kind of squarely in, in between all of those interests. And we really learn a lot from staying in that, in that middle place. Um, just quickly, if you looked back at what people were really saying, you know, in 2013, 2014, 2015, you know, there, you saw a lot of stuff written about the grid going away. Um, grid parity was the big word everybody said, and grid parity meant, you know, all the distributed systems were going to grow so fast, so cheap that we weren't going to need a grid. Now, I wrote about decomposing an electric power grid into time and area specific costs and size specific costs 35 years ago, you know. I didn't think the grid was going away. I thought it was going to be more integrated. This happened even much faster than I thought, and it is going to be much more integrated in the future, but it's certainly not going away. <clears throat> um, this is just, you know, when I left here, I went to work for EPRI, did a whole bunch of case studies on, on various what we call local integrated resource plans, which are how to embed solar storage, demand response inside utility systems to get maximum value. And then if you look back at the industry, you know, we have Edison's Pearl Street Station here, and the grid has been, you know, the most fantastic example of, you know, engineering and economics coming together to create this massive machine that lowered costs, you know, as we got more and more diverse loads over time, and we were able to lower costs and, in, and increase usage. <clears throat> What's happened more recently is economies of scope and scale have run out in the bulk power system. So we're basically flat. 
And the cost of locating big, giant power systems has gone way up. Joskow wrote about this in a famous paper, Inflation and the Environmental Concern. So that you know, about 50 cents on every dollar is spent on citing project development costs on that. So it is really hard to develop big, giant bulk systems. That doesn't mean the grid is going away, because the marginal cost of the grid is almost nothing. You've got this grid. It's a wonderful, fantastic machine. The marginal cost is really low. We might not be building as much big, giant bulk grid in the future, but we're certainly going to use the heck out of the bulk system we already have. And then you saw, you know, and this is an, an old sunshot, you know, number here for, and this is rooftop PV. You know, grid systems are, you know, down around four cents a kilowatt hour, but rooftop PV, you know, is, is down, you know, 13, 14, 15 cents unsubsidized. And we saw some electric utility all in embedded costs that got up higher, you know, than those amounts. This was not grid parity, right? Um, this does not mean you throw away the grid. This just means it's a rate design problem. Basically, I don't have, I've got my embedded cost of the entire grid against a rate that somebody sees for a rooftop PV, and, and a lot of people can make a lot of money off of that. You know, looking forward, you know, when you look at any of these pathways cases or any large decarbonization cases, you know, a pathway through a lot of this is electrification. So we're going to have electrification of transportation, electrification of buildings, electrification of all kinds of different things. The last thing you want to do is throw away the grid and have big amounts of electrification. Um, so to get ready for electrification, you need to begin to think, what's going to be served locally? What's going to be served at the bulk? And how do we integrate them together? And then I stole this. Um, you know, the Japanese, as usual, are in front of everybody and not telling anybody. Um, so they have you know, whole cities who are working on how do we basically take the cars, the utility systems, the power systems, the IT stuff, and stick them all together. And they have a government that can tell a utility what to do, tell the car company what to do, and everybody works together. So it's just a vision of the electrification system, how it might work 10, 20, 30 years from now. And it has lots of things connected to the grid. So I hope everybody will just agree with me um, that we're going to need a grid. The grid's going to need to be a, a lot more flexible than it is now. And it might need to be, and this is where we get to fat or skinny, it might need to have a not, not a lot of the same people and other stuff attached to it, but there is a big need for the grid. And as we decarbonized, you know, the utilities have called it plug and play, which means a lot of diff different things are going to connect to it. Anybody fundamentally disagree with kind of that general direction? It's not going to look like it is now, but we're going to need some kind of grid. Um, it was interesting, a really good friend of mine went to work for, for Google, and I ride bikes with him every month. And he was running their whole energy practice. And I said to John, you know, what, what do you think, you know, what do you think Google's main strategy is on energy? And he said, well, when I got there initially, it was totally disruptive, decentralized, blow apart the utility system. And if you think about the one company that depends on the grid, you know, it is Google. I mean, grid is the grid of all grids, right? And so why it, it didn't translate that to another industry, he didn't really understand. But I think there is some misunderstanding that fundamentally, you know, we, we still need a grid, and it's going to be a big grid. The three things that I think are with us, and they're here to stay, and the utilities don't understand are these three things. So technology in all kinds of data processing is here. And you know, sensing and data, data analysis, I mean, you know of all people, that's getting really cheap. Um, so, and solar is getting really cheap. Wind is getting really cheap. So we have a lot of technology pushing on the grid. Um, the second thing is economics is not driving grid anymore. So all of this analysis that I was trained to do about economics of grid and integration is pretty much irrelevant. Most of the grid stuff that's happening to the grid is driven by policy, right? So if we're going to, in California, the three investor-owned utilities spend about 6 to $7 billion a year 
on the clean energy plan, all the RPS stuff, all the energy efficiency, all the other battery storage and everything else. In the decarbonization plans, if you look forward, CARBs plans, those have to ramp up to you know, 14 or 15 billion a year. So you've got to ask yourself, you know, are the utilities up to it? Are our institutions up to it? Um, and then this last thing, that this is the most disruptive piece of all, and this is the question that all my old time utility clients would always ask me. And it wasn't in, in terms of democracy, it was in terms of retail choice. Do you think customers really want choice? And I would say up until three or four years ago, I was kind of halfway in their camp and I would say, you know, maybe not, maybe all this choice thing's not real. This democratization of energy is real. And that is, and I heard somebody at a talk two years ago saying, he thought that major decision makers in energy were going to be small towns and cities. And I didn't really understand what he was talking about, but if you think about it in terms of democratization, you know, it's people want to control what, what they're doing. And that's why this community choice aggregation has been so popular in California, is because it gives people a vote in, and it democratizes <laughs> the energy choices. That piece is not going away. And that's squarely at odds with a big, giant, fat utility that makes all the decisions for you. As efficient as that may be, as technology efficient, as economic efficient as all that might be, it's squarely opposed to the democratization of energy because just somebody else is making a decision for you. Um, so I think you know, for utilities to evolve, whether they evolve fat or skinny, all three of those things have to be in their plans whether they're doing it or something, or somebody else is doing it. So you know this story, which is solar PV costs, whether it's rooftop or whether it's grid connected, have just gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, so this is the technology piece driving on that big fat utility model we talked about. Um, you know this piece too. So storage, as it becomes, you know, as it becomes more mainstream, particularly lithium ion, is just cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. It hasn't really gotten super cheap yet, but it's projected to get cheap. So when you get rooftop solar or grid-connected solar combined with wind, and you have some kind of storage, puts even more pr pressure on the big fat utility model. And then you know, if you add democratization to it, now you've got potential jailbreak from the big fat utility that does everything. <clears throat> and then you know we know, you know, customers want to do things. So when you make it cheap like Nest thermostat or any other kind of automation, then you can have not only you know, generation moving to match load, but you can have end uses moving to match load too. And that's not really super expensive and a lot of different small companies can participate in that. And that adds to the whole democratization of the energy system. So policy, you know, if all of those things, if you know, making it your own, bring in policy, and technology can all come together you know, to be consistent with our long-term overarching policy goals. That's when you get policymakers aligned with technology and with finance people. And it can blow apart a utility system and a grid unless it's, it's responsive to it. Um, in the, you know, we've taken our pathways model and tried to make it digestible to the person who cares about you know, energy choices. And if you look at all of these pathways, cases to decarbonization, you know, they have conservation of, of, every kind, of everything we're doing. They have some form of electrification. They have, you know, the our renewable portfolio standards to decarbonize the power system. And they have some decarbonize of the other fuels that we have left over. And those are all things that, you know, that every one of these small little, you know, towns, or community choice aggregators, or just group of people are interested in doing any one of these. So if a utility doesn't offer you combinations of these things, and it line up with the policy, then it puts you know, more pressure on, on the power system. Um, I don't have to go through these. These are just ways you decarbonize the, the grid. Most of the people who study energy are interested in all these know. I will say that in the West, we are totally focused on renewables. But if you think about the northeast of the US, we've been doing a lot of work in New York and Boston. 
And an old friend of mine, who I've known for 30 years, I said, John, what is, the, what is your decarbonization plan for the eastern seaboard really look like? And he said, it's hurry up and do gas, and then hurry up and get rid of it, which you know just doesn't make much sense. And it's really hard to get wind all the way through, you know, from the Midwest through Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and up into the Northeast. It's really hard for them to get new gas pipelines and push back on the policy. So, you know, we're going to need multiple sources and multiple pathways, and it's not going to be all renewables all the time. I think there is room for other, for other sources to decarbonize the power grid. And when you put all that together and you put it in a whole bunch of models and you have stakeholder processes, you end up in California with these, these kind of massive, giant renewable plans on the power system. You know, this is California in each year, and this is solar, utility, and customer-owned, and then there's battery storage. And look at the size of these. These are megawatts. You know, we have a system that is 50,000 megawatts at peak now. You know, we flattened it. Gil, you know, we've basically pushed back on the efficiency and totally flattened out the growth. But we're going to end up with, you know, 200, 250,000 megawatts of installed capacity. And there's a concept here that that we learned only about three or four years ago, and it came out of our analysis with this duck curve stuff that the California Independent System Operator was working on. And for 50, 60, 70 years, we've been working on capacity, which was the ability to produce energy in real time. There is no shortage of capacity. There's no ancillary service, massive shortage of capacity in any of these high renewables cases. We are. You know, John, my analogy is we got 40 good guys on the bench who could come in and play at any time. And so I don't worry. I just bring the next guy in. It's next man up. There's tons of people who could provide capacity. In any, any of that system, I do not worry about capacity. In fact, capacity prices and energy prices are totally crushed in here. What do you think the energy or capacity or ancillary services market looks like in any of these things? It's almost nothing. In fact, it's negative because I've got overgen, right? But I still have billions and billions need to be financed in that market. So the question is, how does it get done? Who's financing this? Is the state doing it? Is the utility doing it? You know, who's doing it? And who's serving it? Um, and that's why I wrote that paper, you know, fat or skinny. I think as a regulator now, you need to decide, are the communities doing this? Are the individual customers doing it? Are the utilities, which have gotten us this far, up this trail, doing it? Or is it some other different kind of model? Because um, the road we're on now does not get up the summit. It doesn't even get close. There's no way that you could put this on the backs of the way the current utilities are structured now off of their balance sheets. <clears throat> and there's no markets that you can think of that come with short-run capacity markets or even longer-run capacity markets that would give you that either. So to make matters worse, in this case, you know, people, the existential question, if you're a regulator in New York or Hawaii or California, is what you'd really like to do is just stuff all this choice back in the box and tell it to go away, right? Cities, you can't play in this. You know, we're going to go back to our other model where we have this, you know, big utilities. They report to the governor. The governor calls up the Public Utilities Commission. And then they talk to the utilities and they say, you know, do all these long-term contracts. And then do electrification of buildings too, do contracts for all those, and do all the car stuff as, as, you know, with that. Um, we're not going to be able to push that back. Try going to the legislature and, and trying to take democratization away from cities. You just can't do it. So we're in this kind of, we're on this trail that doesn't get there. And utilities are in an all-out war with you know, these people now who have choice and feel empowered by it. And we don't know how to take the next step on the policy side. <clears throat> so one, where the rubber meets the road for a utility with a customer is through its rate making. Um, that was the first job I had coming out of undergrad. Is somebody told me, make a spreadsheet of PG&E's, all of its costs, and make all the rates. Um, because the guys they hired right after World War II, 
they were going to retire, and they were terrified those guys were going to retire, and nobody would know how to do the rate making. So I followed these guys around, made friends with them, they taught me how to do rate making. And basically, rate making was you take the embedded cost of the utility, that's what it spent, and you try to put it in all the places that nobody will complain very much. It's very much like kind of tax making, you know, here, had nothing to do with contestable markets, you know, no segment of their markets were contestable, right? So it was all put it where nobody would find it or see it, and nobody would complain. Um, and you know that's the way rate making still exists in for every utility, and that's why the rates are all screwed up, and they don't reflect this fixed variable world we we have. <clears throat> um, so when you look at Hawaii's. We just finished all the, and I did in Gil's class last year, the Hawaii plan for 100% renewables. It's just, um, it's mind boggling when you look at each island and how much they have to do to meet that plan. But what you look, the first thing you notice is all the costs are fixed and there's just no variable costs anymore in that system. And so we've gone from a world where we had 50% variable to 50% fixed to like 90 or 95% fixed and a little bit of variable, right? And so what you really know in rate making is, OK, and now if I'm going to open that market up to choice with democratization, and part of it's going to be contestable, demand response, storage, PV systems on the roof, well, I better get that pricing right. I better get the variable right at the right time, the right size, the right location. And unless I get it right, what I get is what we call uneconomic bypass. I get a whole bunch of rich people who have access to this through net energy metering, exiting the pool, and I get poor people who don't have access to capital stuck, right? It's just exactly like the healthcare analogy. So I can't basically leave the utility like it is. I have to do, I have to convert their rates to fixed variable. You know how much all the solar providers love fixed charges, right? They're totally against all fixed charges because it doesn't allow them to spin the meter backwards on the net energy metering and basically make the big giant returns. But if they're coming down in costs really fast, you can make a deal, like I don't know if you saw the deal that was made in New York. You can make a deal between the solar providers and the utility where you say, look, here's the deal you got. It's really rich, but we know, you know it's politically popular. Here's a full value tariff, which has fixed and variable in the right way. We know, let's just do a glide path between them, and let's link those up. And that's going to basically pave the way for, it could be a fatter utility in the long run or a skinnier utility either way, but it's going to preserve a grid. It's not going to allow all these people to exit and make a huge amount of money and provide a, there'll be a reasonable transition. Utilities who do not back the card up out of the mud and find this pathway really quickly are going to be in a heap of trouble really fast. <clears throat> Um, you also have to convince the big giant utilities that demand response once they do all this, which could include DGPV and batteries and everything else, is a good thing for them. So we talk about the evolution of rate making needs to get to margin neutral rates. That is, if you come or go, it sh they should be indifferent. Their non-participating customers should be indifferent. If you locate in a place that is really valuable, Remember, Gil, we talked about that, the locational, marginal cost of all those things? Then you should get paid for that. We've created a whole value of VDER, all the DER attributes that you could put in a locational system. And in New York, they've created this kind of platform, and the utilities are trying to stand that platform up now that will pay distribution avoided costs for lo locational benefits for putting in DER resources. This is a good thing for utilities because it lowers their costs and makes them more competitive. So it's, again, a sustainable way that high DER can live with a big grid. <clears throat> so now let's talk about if we know that, that those are the three driving forces here, we know that utilities need to kind of unbundle their rates here. <clears throat> what are the things about, you know, what this utility might look like and what the industry structure might look like going forward to accommodate those forces. So without going through all of the detail of all this, you have the historical electric utility grid functions over here, and there are a whole bunch of them. 
If you ask any utility in New York, we had we actually did stickers for all the things they they do, and whether I'll show you a little bit a picture of that. And then over here, this is tomorrow's industry, and it's got a whole bunch of things connected to the grid, right? And there has to be a whole bunch of rules on how these things get connected to the grid and make sure nobody cross subsidizes everybody else and there's a way to, to make them all go. And then we're going to reach something if we do this in a rational way where it's affordable and it's reliable, right? And that can be fatter than you think of and it can be super skinny just wires company. Both sides of those can get to that solution. <clears throat> And if you look at what's going on, particularly on the coast, you know, the blue areas are the, are the ones, but you know, particularly why leading this charge is California, Hawaii, and New York on the two coasts. And these are, they generally fall into these big proceedings called smart grid. <clears throat> and what they really are doing is they're figuring out if there are two-way flows in the grid, you know, how is this gonna, really gonna work? So is there a separate distribution company that works on all those two-way flows. And what they did in New York is they said, if you're going to have a separate distribution company, you might as well have a distribution operator. And then you peel apart the operator from the owner. We saw that in the bulk power system. We had transmission system operators who had, gave access to the common carrier, and then all kinds of producers could sell into it. And so in New York, they're working on a concept called a DSP, a DSP, distribution service provider, is nothing more than a utility who owns, um, and then they have, I'll show you a picture of this, they have an operator too underneath them that would operate the grid and allow third party access to the distribution system too. And then these are just the utilities that are kind of leading in these types of activities, and they have all kinds of things going on over here that support the full integration of small scale stuff interconnected to the grid that can provide benefits to the grid. And you see in the literature a big fight between these things, um, a, a distribution operator, system operator, um, an owner, and a distribution service provider. Um, it was funny, um, I know Audrey Zimmelman fairly well from previous work, and she, when she went to run the New York Commission, she created this concept of a distribution service provider. And Right after she left, I got the job to sit down with the utilities in New York and say, okay, Audrey's written for about two years about a distribution service provider, and you guys are right on the front lines of what that is. Do any of you know what she was talking about? Nobody. I mean, nobody would get up and say, I know what it is, and here it is. So we spent about three months working with them on what it really is. And it was different things, you know, in, in, in upstate New York, it's totally different than in New York City. You know, if there is a distribution operator, it is New York City, because it's doing all that stuff already. It's a networked grid. It's super fancy already. You know, Central Hudson, Ni Niagara Mohawk, which is now National Grid, it's pretty far away from a distribution, you know, a DSP, and doesn't really see huge amounts of value in doing all that. So you might see Con Ed go a little bit faster than the other utilities on this. But you're going to see them probably leading on the front of peeling apart. What this really is is, remember when we deregulated the bulk power system? <clears throat> the functions in the distribution system, there are many of them, the distribution utilities are doing. Some of them are commercial, some of them are natural monopoly, and we're going to separate them and try to get the distinctions clearly out there so you can actually run markets around them. <clears throat> So a big cautionary note for me and why I wrote this paper about fat or skinny is if you are basically an electric utility and you have bundled service rates. So those are, you know, half the electric utilities in North America still have bundled service rates, right? They're not in restructured industries where they pulled apart transmission. And various parts of your market become contestable and you don't unbundle them. Um, you're going to get all kinds of uneconomic bypass. And the classic case, where it worked really nicely where we got this right is natural gas. We peeled apart and did natural gas. We have integrated wholesale markets. We have pipelines all over the place. And it really worked nicely so there wasn't any capital that was put in the wrong place. <clears throat> Our worst example of all this is railroads. 
the railroads had highly regulated bundled rates. And then they got airline and trucking competition who picked them apart on various things. And it almost became totally unsustainable before those were fixed. Um, so we know that these utilities, regardless of whether they are fat or skinny, are going to have to peel apart their rate structures. And the, the hard thing about them is you ask, you know, what was that plant built for? What was that wire built for? And you ask an engineer, and it was because there was a customer there. Well, was it energy, or was it capacity, or was it just that customer, or was it the other one? And they say, you know, all of those things. So they're really, they're joint costs. This is a joint cost allocation problem. And unless there are markets out there that tell you the value, the classic case is, you know, what's the cost of milk and cream, you know, from a cow? You know, they come together. So unless you have a value for milk or a value for cream, you can't price those things effectively. And it's the same thing here. It's really hard to do this. So what we've thought about is ways electric utilities, fat or skinny, can begin to take all the different fundamental things, you know, the things they do at the second level and the things they do at the yearly level, and how they can unpeel them into their rates so that they get the right stuff at the right location, at the right size, at the right time. It doesn't run them over, but it helps them. And the way we've, we've thought about this is not in super complex real-time pricing you know, forms or locational marginal pricing, but really in, in rates that have what we call multi-part rates. So there's just like telecom, there's an access fee. It's a dollar per, you know, per month for that class. And it's size specific. So you don't have to have all residential customers at the same you know, $30, $40, $50 a month. It can vary size specific. <clears throat> There's another part that's still historical embedded costs, and this is the grid access charge. And this is, can be access charge of the transmission system or distribution system. It's also typically size specific, although you can have it like average KWH, which is what they're going to probably start with in New York for size, which is kind of size specific. But it doesn't require kilowatt you know, detailed metering, potentially. And then this is the fancier piece, is once the utility collects its fixed charges, you know, it can pay distribution resources this full spectrum of value to the generation system, the transmission system, and the distribution system. And it can begin to put these out on a transactive platform that people can begin to trade. But it's got to really, you know, get these in place first. And this was what I thought was so special about the New York deal, which was, okay, we're going to the multi-part tariff but we're going to do it in a transitional way so we're not going to destroy your market right away. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, when you begin to think what's sexy about this, because everything, you know, everything storage is sexy. So the storage guys, particularly in New York or in Hawaii, you're going to want to have a market for something. You know, you can begin to think, and these are the kind of fixed costs of the utility system. These are more of the variable costs. Remember those time frames I was looking at? And then these things up here are really you know, the locational benefits of potential storage. You know storage is really costly per kilowatt hour, but it's really cost effective if deployed in the right way. And as basically we get more and more and more overgen, it's going to be able to be used in the bulk system and in the local system to combine. So you can begin to what we call do stacked benefits, which give you a stacked benefit to the bulk system, and then a locational marginal price at the top, too, that's based on deferral rather than congestion. And you can get a really high value that you can deploy a storage device in as well. <clears throat> so back to fat or skinny. Um, and uh, I, I got the unenviable job of basically in the retail access on Bonk that was a month and a half ago. I had the the three investor-owned utilities, as, and I was the panel supposed to explain to the legislature what their issues were and the PUC commissioners. And I, got, I had four different talks with them. And initially, they were just basically didn't know what to say about how do we, as grid operators, really um, project a value to the state going forward? What is our value to the, to the system? You know, and my recommendation was start with, you know, state energy policy. You know, what is the state energy policy? If you're talking to legislatures, talk about what the state energy policy. It's got democratization in it. It's got distributed generation in it. 
It's got a massive, huge carbon lift, and they, don't want, and they want to have rates that are affordable. So what can you do as the grid operator to make that happen? What was so interesting in Audrey's vision of this is the utility could kind of move their self out of harm's way from market forces and all those things and become distribution system operators, just like they are transmission system operators, and let the market work, if it does work. And what we did in New York is we sat down with all the utilities and we said, OK, in this, this fat version of a distribution service provider, if we take all your things that you do today and we make them from existing functions, there were not a huge amount of blue, but evolving functions, you see, this stuff here is starting to change rapidly as the market is moving and all those forces are coming and new technology is coming. Where do you put it? Do you put it, do you ring fence it and put it in a distribution operator? Or, or do, you, and do you put it with an owner? And went through an exercise of where the utilities were in all these functions. They don't all come out at the same place, but they're all thinking about which functions would I ring fence around to be operators versus which do I keep with the fundamental regulated utility? And this is the guts, this is the back in the kitchen of what happens in fat or skinny. And there's going to be all kinds of models that evolve here. Um, you can begin to see right away, where I went right away with them is, how does this look to you? You know, what if we take all those things that are evolving, and I even had some more over here, and make them into an operator? Um, you know, is this good or bad for you? And it depends on whether you think you're going to compete in this market or not. You know, my starting point with them is if you're going to compete, if you're going to be a battery owner or a DGPV owner, um, this thing actually protects you because you've got now bids and calls and you can win your own bids and calls, but these guys are ring fence and they're independent over here so you can actually play in that market. If you're not going to bid, and own all of that distributed stuff, then you could, it's easier to keep it bundled up with your wires over here. And certainly all the data that goes into bid evaluation, everything has to go over there. <clears throat> and then just as I'm closing this out, um, think about what I said about kind of moving up the mountain and whether California is ready for this. Um, you know, we're, if you go to this thing right here, we're just starting to get the motor warmed, warmed up over here on renewables. But utilities are forecasting very rapidly. Within the next several years, they're not going to be serving very much loads. This is an existential problem for the legislature, for all the regulators, and potentially even the utility if it's still got the big giant lift to do all this stuff and the electrification and the cars, but it doesn't have any loads. Who's doing them? The other thing is the Public Utilities Commission says it does not regulate all these entities. The legislature created these entities, these cities, community choice aggregators, who aren't really regulated by the PUC. Um, I mean, it, on purpose. You know, the legislature has always been really frustrated that, you know, the, the entities that report directly to the governor's office are not regulated by them. So, you know, the, it was always their frustration that those entities are a little bit out of control because they didn't report to them. The, the real answer to that is they're reporting to the governor. There was that, that design is on purpose. But what we're going to need is what we call one of three, these three corrections. Either we're going to need to reinvigorate what we call the state policy path. That is, stand up the regulators and say, I don't care if you're Peninsula or you're Alameda or you're Sonoma or you're Marin Clean Energy, you're going to be regulated just like all utilities, right? You've got to do your share of the buildings, cars, all the renewables, efficiency, everything. So imagine going to the legislature with that, which is basically, I'm going to take this entity that you don't like after anyway, and I'm going to give them these big, giant powers to regulate all these cities that you created this special legislation to get around them in the first place. So it's kind of interesting, because I think the PUC default position is this, is we're going to try to get back, we're going to try to basically get this road back on track, because it's something we already know. Down here, um, so people say, well, we have cap and trade, right? So why not just let it rip, right? We got cap and trade, let cap and trade go until 
the dirty little secret about cap and trade is nobody ever thought cap and trade prices could get really much above 60 80 90 dollars a ton i mean john you were on those committees until they would blow it up right um, so we know when we run our pathways cases those costs per ton are all you know those marginal cases when we start doing they're all over 200 bucks so remember we don't have coal to gas you know we're now renewables, hydro, everything else is clean on clean on clean. So that incremental cost of carbon reduction is costly. It's buildings and stuff. And it's not the Amory super cheap stuff. It's pretty expensive now as we're going through there. So nobody thinks this really has legs, although we are going to lean on it more and more. So we're kind of in our office betting on this middle path. We're betting that some deal comes. The utility spent about $120 billion over the last 15 years you know, six billion or so a year, seven billion a year. They want to get their money back. The community choice aggregation folks say, okay, if we give you your money back and you give us the bill for that, how do we know you're not going to be doing a bunch of stupid stuff 10 years from now and sending us another bill and another bill and another bill, right? So even though they probably won't like the idea that there's some state entity like NYSERDA or in Illinois that, that backs you up, you know, it might be a middle path, you know, to get through all this by saying, let's have a state entity. If you don't buy your share of all the things you need to do, that state entity buys it for you and then sends you the bill. Um, and then you get low a low-cost financing way to do it. Either you develop your own low-cost financing way or the state does it based on a 100% debt case in, in, off of their balance sheet. Yep. I am done, John, with this. So the wrap up is I've gone through a lot. And uh, <clears throat> any, any questions about any of this? Thank you. Uh, let's take about 10 minutes. We, we usually start with students. Any student questions? And we'll come back to you. OK, you got it. You're ready. So uh, maybe I represent the enemy. I helped found Silicon Valley Clean Energy and sit on the board. I was the founding yep. chair. Uh, we were, made, frankly, impatient with high rates. Yep. We looked at Santa Clara and other municipal utilities charging 30% less yep. than the IOUs. We looked at uh, getting greener faster. Our electricity now is 1% under PG&E across the board and 100% carbon free. So from my perspective, uh, the CPUC regulating monopolies hasn't done as good a job as municipalities. So I don't need the legislature, I don't need the governor, and I don't need the CPUC to get carbon-free electricity for less. What's wrong with that model? I, I, don't think there, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a really good model. I think it meets the three things we said are happening, right? Yeah. And it makes them happy. So that you guys need to then, as a whole group, and what I think what is happening is the, the real people who really want to do this will step forward and carry that. And there'll be some people who put it back in the box. I think there's a whole group of people now, and it might be broader than everybody who wants to really move forward with all of that. So if we want to have a meaningful part in the discussion, we're now generating, it looks like our excess over revenue, right. excess over our cost is about 20%. PG&E would call that profit. We would call that return to shareholders, or it could be for for uh, rebates to customers, or it could be for programs to help with fuel switching, transportation. Yep. What do you think we ought to be uh, considering? I think all of those, the, all the electrification, all the building stuff, you know, the utilities and the and CARB have not made big grounds on. And we think they're big opportunities for folks like you to basically be more connected with your businesses and your customers and really advance the ball on those. And I think you could work both with the utilities and with the PUC in getting funding also for programs like that. Because quite frankly, they're behind in those areas. Yeah, I, I think they're behind in most areas. Thank you. <laughs> uh, very interesting, uh, this whole thing. Being involved with the CPC and legal proceedings and so forth. Um, this has, has missed some fundamental realities. And it's not your fault, necessarily, but it's common. Uh, there's no such thing as renewable energy, if you remember your high school science class. And solar is not getting cheaper. If you go to Puerto Rico, they have to replace almost all their solar panels. If you go there, they have to replace almost all their wind generators. 
if you watch the video of a helicopter flying over Puerto Rico and, and filming the destruction, that makes solar extremely expensive because not only do you have to replace it because of one storm, which happens a year or a few years, but you have to do something while the people are out, while hospitals are out. Now. Electric cars do no good on Puerto Rico under those circumstances. They'll do no good in Hawaii under certain circumstances. <coughs> so this needs some common sense. And, and I, I, unfortunately, the hoopla about renewables is misleading so many people. Our peninsula of clean energy, for instance, could not figure out how to audit their sources to be sure they're actually carbon free. They're not, they don't know. And in fact, the recent bill that was unfortunately not passed by the legislature before they yeah. left, which was trying to break up the ISO structure in California, you probably know, yeah. was going to allow coal from Berkshire Hathaway Energy and via Pacific Corp through the north. California burns a hell of a lot of coal. LA has a 1.9 gigawatt coal plant in Delta, Utah, with a line directly to LA. The legislature made a big mistake for the CCA's way they did. You brought up the fact they're not regulated. Yes, I was at a board meeting of Peninsula Clean Energy where the chairman of the board had attended a CPUC meeting and was explaining how careful he had to be not to say certain things so that the CPUC wouldn't get the idea that they should be regulated. California is absolutely crazy. <coughs> energy, it is, it is totally in the wrong direction. If you want to actually double your clean energy in California, it's very simple. You keep the Apple Canyon running and you fix the steam generators at San Mano Creek. And all of a sudden, that's 40% of California's <coughs> clean energy. I think this whole thing has to be looked at with a much more adult, much more scientific, much more engineering and honesty position then all this renewables through fraud, which is going to cost a lot of money and which people do not realize the pollution created when those things are built, deployed, redeployed, redeployed, redeployed. I think we have a response. Now to response, I just had a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm serious. I wasn't hearing one. But uh, you mentioned that the ancillary services markets will go into very low prices. Yep. And, and what causes that when the duck curve looks like it would be getting well, very significant? Yeah, I mean, basically, there's an energy shortage, right? So we, we always think about shortages in terms of capacity. And so we need to pay people for capacity. But what we really have is we're managing energy imbalances, right? And when you get a whole bunch of renewable system, you know, energy on the system, you're managing imbalanced energy. And when you look at the Hawaii cases, this becomes really clear, is what you're really worried about in Hawaii. Um, solar is pretty easy to manage because the overgen pattern is fairly consistent. What you're really worried about is the week or two week long period where you don't have any wind. And you know, the way we solve that is we said, look, Let's just basically keep all the old plants around. We need them, right? So don't mothball them, don't shut them down. You can convert them to biofuels, they can run. Even if biofuels are really expensive, it doesn't really matter running them for one week or two weeks a year. You can integrate all the wind and the solar. You're gonna put some shorter duration storage in there, but you can keep all the plants and the existing system in there as well. Same answer applies to the California system. <laughs> we have one up here and then one in the back. Yeah. Bert runs the Infineon. We're building a startup around distributed generation. And I really like the key nuggets you offered about pricing and policy because those are the slow moving elephants. I'm pretty sure that we, most of us know those Clayton Christensen. Can you tie Clayton Christensen's disruption theory together with the challenge that we have to get more? carbon-free electrons into the ground. Yeah, I, you know, my view is, is this, the renewable thing's not the problem. It's the buildings, really, and it's the cars. 
you know, is if you look at what California's done, it's spent a bunch of monies on renewables that got cheap. And we, yes, we helped drive them down. The Germans helped drive them down, et cetera. But we really haven't done anything on building. Um, and yes, Amory helped us. Yes, Title 24 is, is better than everybody else has. But we don't have, you know, that whole massive ESCO market, Gil, that we all talked about 30 years ago, it's gone nowhere. Um, and all the AMI data and everything else ROM works on to try to free all that and provide signals, it hasn't stood up anybody on the side to, to really do, do you know, deep energy efficiency. And the, the car issue is still a question for me. Um, so I don't know, you know who's going to build the infrastructure for the cars. And we're doing a bunch of cases where we're trying to actually make um, the utility step forward and do the make readies for all the you know, high voltage charging downtown, electrification of transportation downtown, et cetera. I mean, looking at Germany in 2012, I was in Berlin. Better places were still around. I'm, Germany, I'm, as the really the leading country, was yep. poo pooing on electric vehicles in 2012. Yep. What has happened now? Literally, today is a conference on electric vehicle infrastructure in Germany and Stuttgart today. Yep. Five years of big change. Now, what triggered that change? But how do you get the mass behind it? Since all this disruption is making something that's a commodity, low price available to the masses in a way that the big incumbents say, oh, this is too small. We're not going to care. So we can build the stamina behind it on a very large scale on what blockchain does. You know, what yeah. It becomes a very big deal. How can we translate that to energy? I'm really sick and tired of the U.S. I'm actually entering the market in India. It's like, forget <laughs> all this. Like, cheap. Go yeah. there with a little bit. Patricia, you want the last word? Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, you made a note about how um, the uh, cap and trade market is expected to get to prices that the public probably will not support. And I'm wondering what your take is on what the state should do, given that assumption that doesn't that hopefully avoids totally undermining the industry's uh, yeah. faith in the policies set forth by the legislature? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I don't know if you guys were following the legislative session this last time. I guess the message from me is don't ever bet against Jerry Brown. Um, do, you remember, do you remember two years ago when he got smoked by the oil companies? Um, and they were advertising that Jerry Brown's going to take away your van and all that other stuff. And, and he said, you know, this is only round one. And I don't know if you saw what happened. The sleeper bill that went through that he, you know, is going to push through basically allows CARB of all places to do all the point source regulation plans for basically all the industry that's left in California and what's left, refineries. So yes, refineries are going to be regulated with carbon. The deal he made is carbon is global at the state level. We're going to track all that. But all your point source emissions, and if all, we've been tracking all those. They're all the refineries. So basically, he put, he basically, that's the, the trend down on the refinery thing is going to be real now. And if they don't invest in the alternative future, they're not going to be in California anymore. Great. With that, we're kind of over time uh, with a, a dynamite discussion. But thanks. Thank you. Thanks again.